Segment three, Gold and Black Live, live from the football performance complex. A couple days before the Purdue, uh, Purdue Challenge 5K, and we've had Jeff Brom and, and Chris Barkley on our show the first two segments. If you missed those, uh, we'll replay them. Uh, this is a segment you don't want to miss. O'Brien so Newbert, our uh, resident expert on just about everything gold and black, uh, and, and uh, that's just the greatest intro you've ever had, isn't it? A little embellished. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's but, early. But much appreciated. Yeah. Obviously. Brian, Brian is uh, really, uh, there's so many things to talk about, but I think one of the things, uh, obviously, we're still pretty fresh off the end of the basketball season, and what a finish it was uh, for Matt Painter's team, an amazing uh, run. And yet you've covered a lot of these things. Uh, is there a way now, a, a week and a half removed from uh, the Virginia loss but the end of the season to, to put the, kind of what this team accomplished in perspective? Yeah, I think this is, a, this is a season that might change the way people look at NCAA tournaments from here on out. Yeah. Look at seasons from here on out because this was sort of a season that sort of redefined possible uh, yeah. in the sense that nobody figured Purdue could win the Big Ten. Uh, coming into the season, midway through the season, certainly. And then when you got to the NCAA tournament, I don't think anybody saw Purdue getting within an eyelash of the Final Four. I think this reminds people that anything can happen at any time. And I think the lasting legacy of this season might lie in the consciousness of Purdue fans in the sense that every NCAA tournament from here on out, no matter how Purdue looks going into it, and Purdue was a three seed. It's yeah, not like yeah. they were, uh, you know, in the play-in yeah. game. Um, but I think what this season might do in terms of a lasting legacy is just have people knowing going into any postseason, going into any season, anything is possible because anything was possible this season as it turned out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It turned out that way. You're going to say goodbye. Uh, Ryan Klein, Grady Eifert, and of course, Carson Edwards will be heading to the NBA. You know, hard, you know, everybody's talked about Carson Edwards' impact, and it's significant that he, he will no longer be with the program. Uh, but Grady Eifert and Ryan Klein also just uh, yeah, going to be really hard to replace. I mean, good things in the pipeline, but those are two really, really important individuals and very two different skill sets, two things that they brought to this program. Yeah, I don't think Ryan Klein gets credit for the season he had either. Um, I think Ryan Klein got robbed for all Big Ten. Um, robbed. I thought he was clearly an all Big Ten player. I, I think he is going to be really, really difficult to offset the loss of next season. Uh, I thought he had a great year. Not just a good year, a great yeah. year. Yeah, great. I think Grady Eifert was represented so much of what made this team good this year. The effort, the intangibles, the selflessness, all of it. And I, I don't even know how to quantify Grady Eifert's effect on this team. When you look at all the big plays he made, when you look at all of the intangibles, he brought to the table, he directly impacted their one loss record. Yeah. They do not win the Big Ten without him. They do not have the season they had, period, without him. He is going to be really difficult to replace as well. Now, the thing with Purdue is it's always been you don't look for an exact replica of what you lose. Yeah. You just make the best of what you have when you have it. And this season was the best, one of the best examples of that. I, I can think of because obviously this was a very unconventional team, yeah, not just in the body types, but the experience level, the things that sort of defined it as a team. And now Purdue is going to have to not try to be the same, but be different, but just as good. And that is going to be a fascinating process to watch. Three interesting guys and probably more coming in if my numbers are right. And, and uh, uh, Brandon Newman, obviously, Isaiah Thompson and uh, Mason Gillis coming mm -hmm. in. You've watched these guys for a long time and probably about as qualified as anybody to talk about what they'll bring to the table. Take us through each one of them, and obviously Gillis with the injury, but coming back. But uh, what do you expect from those guys, and how do you see that those guys melding into the 2019-20 roster? Well, they have to play now. Uh, that is clear. Brandon Newman, Purdue is starting over at the 2-3, and three basically, uh, in terms of experience in terms of guys who played a lot of basketball for Purdue over a very long period of time. Obviously, Purdue has guys coming back, guys who did some positive things this year, but I think Brandon Newman, when you look at his skill set as a shooter, when you look at his physical advancement walking in the door as a freshman, he is an uncommon body type as a freshman, uh, as an 18-year-old, however old he is. I think he's the guy who jumps out as the guy Purdue needs to lean on right away, probably most. Isaiah Thompson is going to play for Purdue. He gives Purdue uh, sort of that point guard, that true point guard sort of um, 
dimension. Yeah. It didn't necessarily have this season. Uh, he gives them some quickness. He gives them another shooter. When you look at Mason Gillis, obviously Grady Eifert vacates a lot of minutes at the four. Aaron Wheeler is going to move into a, a lot of those minutes. Looks like he's going to be a really good player, but you need two guys in that spot, and that's where Mason Gillis projects. Provided he's 100% healthy, uh, he is physically advanced for his age from a, a size and strength perspective. He's very skilled. He has a good basketball mind. He's a very mature kid. I think he will uh, have a chance to step right into prominent minutes right away. When you look at all three of them, they're all very mature kids, very level-headed guys. They can all shoot, and that's been such a huge part of what has made Purdue successful the last couple of years. You know, for a while there, Purdue had an embarrassment of riches in the post. All these big, yeah. all these big guys. Mm -hmm who were so good, had them all at once. In the meantime, you also had this collection of shooters that were all unbelievably good. Dakota Mathias, Ryan Klein, Carson Edwards, Vince Edwards. They're all gone now too. Ryan Klein, obviously, as we talked about earlier, they're gone now too. Purdue needs its next generation of jump shooters to kind of establish themselves right now. Uh, you look at the guys coming back in the program, the Aaron Wheelers, the Sasha Stefanovic's, I'm sure Eric Hunter will improve over time as an outside shooter, but these freshmen have to be a big part of replenishing that pool because jump shooting has been such an important part of what Purdue has done. And I mentioned before, every team is different. They, they build teams around the strengths of their rosters. Jump shooting and offensive skill is going to be something Purdue wants with every team. And now is time to kind of, uh, to kind of start over there to a certain extent. I thought one of the best uh, byproducts, I guess, if you want to use that term, of the NCAA tournament was the growth of Eric Hunter. I mean, at least mm -hmm. he got thrown in and he had to play and had to produce and did produce uh, even at, against Tennessee and Virginia. Uh, what do you see for him next year? I mean, is he is he is there more development still to the point for him? Uh, what do you, what do you what do you see Matt Painter and company trying to use him, or how do you see them trying to use him? I don't know. That's a good question because he's a guy who can play either backcourt spot. Obviously, Purdue needed him at point guard this year more than anything. Now, the positions in the backcourt, the differences are relatively minute because once the point guard passes off the ball and moves into motion or moves into whatever play might have come from the sideline, he's just another guy out there, uh, one of five. But Purdue needed him sort of initiating offense. They needed him in, in that point guard role. Now with, with Isaiah Thompson coming in, obviously no Joel Eastern coming back, it gives Purdue flexibility. It gives Purdue flexibility to use Eric Hunter off the ball a little bit more as he was recruited for primarily, I think. Obviously, he's going to want to shoot better than he shot as a freshman. I think he will as he's experienced, as he's more comfortable out there. Yeah. It also gives Purdue flexibility with no gel Eastern, which is, I, I think, something that will be really interesting to watch because this is a guy who has a tremendous physical advantage at point guard. Uh, but can fit into a lot of different spots. Do they use him on the wing more now? Do they use him at the four even uh, periodically? I think Purdue can do that. I think it can give them you know, some options there as well. But in, in terms of Eric Hunter, I think you will see the benefits of experience. You will see the, the benefits of comfort. And I think the NCAA tournament was huge for his confidence, as it probably was for all of Purdue's yeah, young players. I, I think in the postseason you saw a pretty good team growing in behind a really good team. I think Travion Williams did really positive things in the postseason. I think Aaron Wheeler did really positive things in the postseason. I think Sasha Stefanovic, through the course of the year, showed himself to be a player Purdue can win with long term. And I just think Purdue came out of the season with its young players, the core of its next few teams, with a lot of momentum. All right, one thing, we're in the football building. And last question for, the, for this show, but I uh, want to talk some football recruiting. Obviously, I think Purdue has three commitments to date. Uh, Jeff Brahms talked about the fact that uh, they'll be back on the road or back back on the road uh, April the 15th. What do you expect in terms of a calendar for them? You know, in terms, would you expect that you, in June there'll be a lot more commitments? Uh, tell me about what what you see the see things playing out with Purdue's class of 2020. Yeah, well, it's been his mo here at Purdue the 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 first two years for me to not be able to put my phone down in yeah. June because they get a commitment every four hours. Uh, I would think that that will be the case again this year. You know, the NCAA went to the early official visits last year, and Purdue's actually got an official visitor coming in this weekend. Uh, but in June, they will host the bulk of their official visits. Uh, when a kid official, officially visits anywhere in the summer, he's planning on making an early decision. So Purdue will once again get a, a significant chunk, I'm sure, of its class committed in June. 
uh, if not sooner. You know, Purdue's got enough momentum right now. They have enough uh, juice, as they say, in recruiting uh, where anything can happen any time. You're seeing Purdue in on a really high caliber of player right now and not necessarily comfort zone type guys. You know, coming out of last season or last recruiting class, I said that, you know, they might not match last year's recruiting success because you don't have George Karloftis in your backyard. You don't have David Bell an hour down the road as a wide receiver, your signature position. I might have been dead wrong because they are in on players out of state that are top 100 caliber players nationally who they've got a great chance to get. I mean, Purdue has so much sway right now in recruiting. It's remarkable how <laughs> much this has transformed in the past year or two. But I would imagine that Purdue will get a good chunk of its, of its class committed once again in the summer. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing that we sit in this building. Brian and I were both talking about that. Uh, and then also the fact that this program has uh, transformed itself. Uh, mostly on the, you know, a 13 and 13 record, I get that. It's got a ways to go. But uh, the recruiting world, that's been probably one of the more stunning things that this, is, this, progr this program is, can, can now recruit at a pretty high level. Right. And the, the attraction for this program in terms of recruiting is not based solely off what you've done in two years. Yeah. It's what people project you to be doing the next couple of years. And Purdue's done a great job building a lot of excitement doing a really good job making personal connections in recruiting that they're just doing everything right in recruiting and when you have enough success on the field to back up what you're saying because when you're a new staff you can be everything to everyone you can paint the prettiest picture possible but then if you don't back it up it becomes really flimsy but purdue has has sold a vision for the future and they've backed it up with the success they've had on the field and i don't think you can i don't think you can overstate what rondell moore has meant to their yeah. recruiting because he has he has done for Purdue football what Carson Edwards just did for Purdue basketball in the NCAA tournament. He has put them at the forefront of minds everywhere, not only of recruits, casual college football fans, college football media. He has, and he has, he has made Purdue's point in recruiting better than Purdue can make it itself by saying, if you come to Purdue and you're a good enough player, we're going to play you, and we are going to find every way possible to make you successful. And he makes, as I said, he makes that point himself better than Purdue could tell it to recruits. Yeah. Hard, they hard, don't yeah. have to, they don't have to take a coach's word for it. They can see it. I mean, he is, you cannot overstate what he's meant to recruiting. Yeah, absolutely. Hard to minimize that. It's a good way to end, end our 2018-19 end our, uh, version of Golden Black Live. Uh, with Rondale Moore conversation. We want to thank our sponsors and, of course, Triple X on the Hill, but on the level of Purdue tradition since 1929. Hilton Garden Inn, when tomorrow's a big day, stayed HGI tonight. State Farm agent Trent Johnson, Trent at myagent.com. And, of course, uh, John Basham, the good folks at Basham Rentals. They have been with us, I think, since we've been doing the show. We will do another show next year. Uh, I promise you that. I think we might launch it on August the 29th. It'll be the day we may, or maybe it'll be game day because it'll be August 30th when Purdue plays Nevada football season. We're not going to wish away the summer, but uh, we're looking forward to, to having that opportunity. I want to thank the good folks at WLFI who constantly move their calendars for us like they did today. Ryan and Eric, uh, we're behind the camera here. Very much appreciated uh, with all their help. Gordon Jackson, of course. Uh, and the folks, uh, Kurt Larman, who's a, uh, has a, he, tomorrow, Saturday's a big day for, for me and, and, and obviously Kurt Larman's battles with, with cancer has, have been uh, documented, at least in, in the group at WLFI, but it's a very, very important day for, for us to pay tribute to, to Kurt and all the work he's done for this show and for us all, all, all the years. And Steve Clark as well, all the folks in the back room, we appreciate your help this year. All right, we will see you in late August. We'll keep you posted when the next show will will happen if you missed part of today's show um, by all means we'll have it on our site and on wlfi.com here within the hour or so and uh, you'll get a chance to watch Jeff Brom, Chris Barkley and the Brian Newbert interview as well. Have a great uh, rest of the day. Hope to see you out here Saturday for the Purdue Challenge. If not, consider a donation and uh, thanks again for watching.